Welcome to the A Midlife Traveler podcast, where we want you to go see the world, discover interesting stories about people, places, and practical advice to help you plan your next vacation. Hello and welcome to the Women Travel Podcast from Midlife Traveler, where we are discovering and sharing travel stories and experiences and advice from women who travel. My name's Laura and I'm your host. And today, the woman you are going to hear from is Erin. Erin is a mother, a wife, a daughter, a teacher, and also a friend of mine. And so what you're going to hear in today's podcast is us reminiscing a bit about our memories of how we got to travel um, when we were kids with our families. And then you're going to hear Erin's stories and learn about how travel was important in, in their lives as a family. And usually their typical family vacations they would take their kids on were all within the U.S., so to national parks or to Washington, D.C. or other places within our own country. But then something happened when her daughter was in high school that changed everything. Her daughter was scheduled to be part of a foreign study group that she was very excited to go to. And just weeks before being scheduled to go, the trip was canceled. So Erin decided, maybe the school can't take you to Europe, but I bet I sure can. So within three weeks notice, she planned an entire trip to Italy with her daughter. Today you're going to hear some of the experiences and memories that she has of that first mother-daughter trip, which was her first international passport stamp. It was such a great experience and opened up a whole new world for for Erin. She knew she wanted to go back, so she shares stories about her next trip, which was returning to Italy with her husband. And in addition to Italy, they also went to England and Iceland. So these are just some great travel stories about what it's like to travel with your daughter or travel with your husband and lots of destination tips and advice sprinkled in between. So I hope you enjoy today's episode and thanks so much for listening. The first trip that I took was when I, well, minor trips to California to visit relatives, Disneyland, that kind of thing, when I was really little. And then my parents would take us to Hawaii every couple of years, and it was an extended family kind of thing. All my aunts and all my uncles and all my cousins, we would all plan a trip to Hawaii at Christmas. And it was about every two to three years that we did that. And so I, there was never a time when I didn't know we weren't going somewhere. That's nice. Nice yeah, it was there. really nice. It was really nice. Um, although my parents limited it to mostly Hawaii, you know, they didn't take us a lot of other places. We didn't see a whole lot of the rest of the country as a kid. And then, um, well, can I interject for a second? Just tell you as my comparator, since I've known you so long, mm-hmm. I wished I got to go to Hawaii when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, my family was goodness. the car drive vacation family. Oh. Let's get in that, that station wagon and drive up and down the West Coast. Let's go to California. Let's go to Arizona. Yeah. I spent so much road time. We did camping. We did trailer camping for a while. And I'm not sure what what, what made the switch um, to Hawaii. But um, we didn't do a lot of road tripping yeah. um, as a family. I did with Girl Scouts. When I was a Girl Scout, we did road tripping. And so the Hawaii thing, and it was a big deal as a kid. Like when you went to Hawaii at the time, that time, it was a big deal. Yeah, it wasn't all the just fancy kids. Got it, to go yeah, to it, and yeah. I felt, and I, I, but I didn't know that. I mean, I knew it was a big deal, but I didn't know that it really was a big deal at that time because people didn't really travel the way they travel now. It was a lot more expensive in relation to the wage you earned. Like I remember how much it cost our whole family. We had a family of five, and it to fly to Hawaii it was fifteen hundred dollars round trip. Well, I think right now you'd be hard pressed to take a family of five. For 1500 but I think uh, the exponential growth hasn't happened for flights. You know, I would agree. I remember my first big international trip was when I, on my own, was when I left to Italy for a foreign study program. I still remember how much I paid for that flight. At that time, which was a long time ago, I think I paid $785 for my flight. Yeah. You can still find flights around that range 
all these years later. So yeah. I, that's a really good observation. Yeah. So the, so with inflation, I don't think I I don't think airfare has kept up with that. So I think that's allowed a lot a lot of people to travel more now. Yeah. Um, in relation to wage growth. Um. So what was your first international trip? So as an adult, what was your first like uh, adult passport stamp? Uh, that would have been Italy with my daughter Fiona, and that came when she was scheduled to go on a high school trip to uh, Scotland in England, and at the last minute it got canceled. She was kind of sad because you know she really was looking forward to this trip, and so we had this chunk of money that was refunded to us, and so I planned a trip to Italy in three weeks with her. So I'm thinking you pulled a mama bear. My girl still gets to go. I'm going to see this through. Is that what you did? <laughs> kind of, yeah. That it was like, you know, I, I knew I had the time at spring break and she had the time at spring break. And we had this, we had this, we considered it sort of free money because we had already paid for it. So it was like this unexpected windfall of travel money that we had already kind of spent. And then we got it back. So, you know, I remember talking to you before you went on that trip. Do you remember the one thing that you really needed to know? Do you remember what worried you the most? Probably having a blonde daughter in Italy. No, that wasn't it. But that would have been a really good one because your daughter is gorgeous. Shoes. You were stressed out about oh, what because shoes. I, because so many people that I had heard <laughs> that had traveled to Italy, they're like, "Oh my gosh, you have to buy really good shoes because the streets are terrible and and your feet are gonna hurt." And so I I got that was a lot of feedback I got from other people was, "You need to make sure you have really good shoes." And so I was like. A lot of the shoes that people told me they got to travel with, they were really ugly. Yeah, that's and, exactly and, Yes, That's and you why to, you were stressed. Yes. You're like, how do I be fashionable? Because Italians are supposed Italy. to be super yes. fashionable, yet have comfortable shoes. Exactly. And that it was turned out to worry. not be an issue at all that I didn't even go out and buy another pair of shoes or anything. I took two pairs of shoes that I already had in my closet that were comfortable and they were perfectly fine. So for the record, I believe that was my advice that I said, well, take whatever you feel most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like it, just buy new ones. Yep. If everyone else is wearing a different style, go to the store and buy that style. What, yep. Whatever helps you yep. feel better. I know. I actually thought I'd buy shoes in Italy. I didn't even buy a pair. Fiona did. She bought a pair of shoes in Italy. But nice. Yeah. Nice. So it turned out fine. So how was it traveling with your daughter then? So she was in high school at the time. Mm-hmm. Just um, the two of you? It was, honestly, it was so easy because both of us were just so excited to be on a trip. And I went in with the expectation that it was her trip. And so whatever she wanted to do, um, I was fine with. I didn't have, it wasn't a trip about me, it was a trip about her. So one of the things that we ended up doing is we stayed an extra day in Venice because she loved Venice. So we changed mm. our plans and stayed there. And um, I would have preferred to go on to somewhere like Florence, but she was really into Venice, and so we stayed in Venice extra So what time. are your thoughts of Venice? I, I really, really personally love the sense of it. It's kind of like an elegant old ghost town on the water. Yes. Um, I, I loved Venice, and when I went back to Venice with my husband, he wasn't as big a fan because he really likes maps and knowing where <laughs> he's going. And in Venice, if you have an expectation that you're going to be... Knowing where you're going at all times should be sadly mistaken. Yeah. There's a huge element of trust in yeah. following the yellow arrows. Yes. And then hoping that when you turn a corner, you see another yellow arrow. And then what happens when you don't? And and um, so for my daughter, who actually, she figured out the navigation of Venice very quickly. And I'd say, oh, we have to turn here. She's like, mom, that's the wrong way. We have to go this way. And she has an awesome sense of direction. And so... Um, I think that's why she really liked it. She felt very competent there, and it was, and plus there's so much to see, even though it's this kind of isolated area. It there's still so much to see there. The the things like St. Mark's Square and all those things that you quote have to see. There's so much more to it than just those things. Right, right. There's and the food. Oh, the food is delicious. Oh, yeah. looking. The Palace. Doge's Palace, did you guys go in? Um, Fiona and I did not go in there. Oh. Um, and I think it was probably because it was one of those days where um, the crowds were overwhelming. 
And I think that that's the part of Venice that my daughter didn't like. I didn't mind it so much, but I, I get it. The crowds sometimes can be stifling and annoying. And the other thing was we had um, not really done a good job planning for the weather, and that day happened to be unseasonably hot. And so I think it was just between the uh, heat and the crowds. What what was your favorite part of Venice? Was there a place or was it a tour or a um, thing you did? The um, Peggy Guggenheim. It was her house. And it's over in the Academy. I don't can't remember what section of Venice that is, but um, the one that sounds like Academy. It's over there. Academia. Academia. <laughs> there we go. But um, the other thing, honestly, one of the things that I really enjoyed that's kind of silly is just getting on the... Um, the boat bus, the yeah, vapor, the vapor ready, and, and yeah. starting and starting out at the beginning, where the, like at the train station, and taking the entire thing around and seeing, getting the lay of the land, and seeing things like the mundane things, like the fire station, or the kids getting out of school, and um, so I really enjoyed things like that, and going to the corner pizza place, and. Um, you know, that's a really good point because I similarly enjoy those kind of moments too. And one of the things that it helps remind me or ground me in is, you know, we go abroad and we travel as tourists, but there are people that live there. They're living their mm-hmm. lives. It's not like you go to the zoo and it's an exhibit. Oh, let's watch the Italians go about their day from behind a glass wall. I mean, you know, these are actually kids going to and from school and it's good to just kind of remind yourself that you're in yeah. the middle of a culture where people yeah. live. You're not going yeah, to, the um, country's not a museum for your own personal Well, in the, the week that we were there, um, that we were with Fiona, um, it was Easter. It was right around Easter. Oh, nice. So it's... the kids came out of their school and they had all of their Easter decorations and all their little art projects that they had made in class. It was just, it was just really cute. It was really cute to see the school. So when you did your mother-daughter trip then, where mm-hmm. else did you go? We started in Rome and did the Colosseum and the Pantheon and all of that stuff. And then we had gone up to Venice. And then uh, Fiona, because she wanted to be an archaeologist, we went to Pompeii. So we took the train down to Naples and went to Pompeii. I've never seen that. Is that pretty cool? Yes. uh, It was was cool, a little bit eerie. Really? And depressing, well, you know, and um, but the one thing we didn't allow enough time because we didn't get to go to the Herculeum to see all the artifacts from Pompeii because they don't house them on site there. So your very first adult very passport first... was you were mama, mama, bearing mama bearing around getting your daughter to mm-hmm. have that European experience that had yes. been canceled. And yes. you guys had a great time. So you came back from that and decided you need to go back. Oh, absolutely. Happened? Well, I mean, that was always the intent that um, Wade and I would travel. As We traveled a lot around the U.S. with the kids, you know, D.C., flying back east and then making a road trip across the national parks like the Badlands, you know, um, Yellowstone, things like that. So we'd always taken the kids traveling around the U.S., but we knew eventually Wade and I would go to Europe. Um, the The side trip with Fiona was just one of those well, what the heck kind of things. So it was always in the plans, but I think once I went to Italy, it was like, when can I go back? Yeah, because it's actually more accessible and easier. Once you get there and doing it, like, oh, this wasn't so hard. Yeah. I could do this again. Yeah, well, in plus, I think every trip you take, you learn a a little tip or you go, okay, next time I'm going to make sure I do this. Like next time I know, like we've talked about in the past, um, I know that almost every flight goes through London, so I know now I can just look for flights to London and then decide where to go from there. And I don't have to have every single moment planned to the trip because I know once I get to London, I can, we can go to Amsterdam, we can go over to Paris, we can go over to Rome, we can, you know, it's, it's, See, you're a a pro now, you're a traveler now, because that's the secret for people out there who are, you know, want to are nervous about travel or they monitor mm-hmm. flights to every crazy destination. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're here in Seattle area. Just monitor where Seattle flies direct. Right. Because once you get there, there are all sorts of other carrier yep. options, train options. Well, and even that first trip, you know, when we went, when Fiona and I went from Rome to Venice, we took the train because I thought in Europe, that's what you do. You take the train everywhere. And I don't think that's the case in all, in all, in everywhere you go now, because sometimes it makes more sense 
if the airport's not a disaster, like some airports are really hard to travel in and out of, but if, if they're not, sometimes it's easier to just hop on a plane Right. You know, EasyJet, Ryanair, you can, we flew from London to Edinburgh for 20 bucks a piece. I mean, and yeah, we had to go at 5.30 in the morning, but, you know, it was awesome. Yeah. We were there in 40 minutes. It's doable. Yeah, it was totally or doable. Or you can actually get into London, like you said, round trip to London, and you can just take the channel. You can take the train underneath the English mm-hmm. Channel, which is just kind of cool to say you've done that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then just go straight to Paris. Oh, yes. London to Paris? Yeah. On a train underwater? Mm-hmm. Bucket I'm, list. I'm okay. in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll try that. Exactly. So, since we're talking about Italy a little bit, I know you've had a, your next trip after that. You did Italy and Iceland and London. London. Mm-hmm. Yes. So let's we tackle. We packed in a lot in that you trip. You did pack in a lot. Yeah, we packed in a lot. But you did the Iceland stopover. We did right? the Iceland you stopover. You did the Iceland Air. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We did the Iceland Air stopover. And we were only there, I think, a total of maybe 36 hours. Um, we did sleep there. We did, had a hotel overnight and really enjoyed our time there. We really, really did. And then we went from there to Rome and then Rome to London. It's a very different vibe going from Iceland to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, we had our... we had our busy. Um, yeah, well, and plus with Iceland, you know, when we we got there, it was snowing. It was cold. So we had our, what we called our disposable winter clothes that we took that we just knew we were going to need in Iceland. You know, gloves, um, a scarf, like ones that we were already going to maybe donate somewhere else. We threw in the suitcase because we do carry on only. We pack really light and do only carry on. And so when we left Iceland, we left, you know, all, our hat, our gloves, our scarf, um, I left a sweater in the hotel and I figured, you know, somebody yeah. might use it. And yeah, because we got from that, we went from there to unseasonably warm weather in Rome. And so when we landed, it was 80 degrees. So, what are some of your favorite yeah. spots in Rome? Or not so much? You know, to me, Rome. From your face, you I, don't seem that impressed. <laughs> no, Rome, I, you know, honestly, I would not have gone back to Rome after going with Fiona, um, except that Wade wanted to see some of the big things in Rome. And I think that it's good that everybody sees some of those those bucket list items like the Colosseum and um, but I kind of felt like Rome is New York with ruins and that's not really the, <laughs> and that's and, and that's not really the pace of travel that that I prefer I prefer something that's more I don't know less hectic it, it just seemed hectic in Rome yeah but you know, I don't know if that's isolated just to Rome because I was having a conversation uh, with someone else recently about cities versus countryside mm-hmm. and how most of these iconic sites, they're in a city. Right. So, you know, you're going to go to Paris, you're going to go to Rome, you're going to go to Dublin, you're going to go to Amsterdam. There's some iconic mm-hmm. thing, but there's also a city there. Right. And is that the most relaxing? They, yes, they have the best art museums and great food, Yeah. but there's a different vibe. You know, we as Americans, I think we we forget that um, how big our country is. Mm-hmm. It's huge, mm-hmm. right? And when you go to a place like Italy, it's so much smaller, and everything is so much more accessible that you can be in a totally different um, climate, just a train ride like two hours away, and you're in a totally different climate. And so when you go to Rome, you can be. It's not that you. I wanted to relax in Rome because you, you have to go in with different thinking. You know you're going into a big city. You know it's going to be hectic. And to build the in times where you can kind of decompress and really enjoy your travels so you don't feel like you're constantly going, 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 or touri, 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 you know, where you're where you're only seeing the things where, that are really crowded with tourists. So we did the, we did do the, um, the tour in Rome where you get to go down in the catacombs and you get to go out on the platform of the Colosseum. Oh, so you did the one that you get to go underneath. Yeah. So that most people don't get to go on into that area. And that was one of the things that I said, well, if we're going to go there, I want to do something different than when Fiona and I went. And when we went, Fiona and I were supposed to go on that tour, but it was um, flooded at that time. Mm. The catacombs had standing water, and so we couldn't go down. So that was that was really cool. I will say that was really cool to spend the extra money to pay for a tour to see more of the Colosseum than just walking in, walking around, and then walking out. That was really cool. So great Italian experiences. We did a bike tour in in Florence. 
that was amazingly fun. And I would recommend that wholeheartedly to anyone, that it was a great way to see the city. We had an awesome time. And Florence is a place that I would love to go back to. So I want to hear about London. So what um, did you guys do in London and what, they, what were your key experiences? Um, museums. Yeah. The museums are amazing. Um, you know, we saw Cleopatra's mummy. We got to see the Rosetta Stone. I mean, it's oh, and the, and plus they're no they're no charge, donation only. Museums are all free. Really? Okay. Yes. And amazing art. Um, amazing. Um, and Wade and I aren't artists at all, and we were completely overwhelmed by just the. You know, you walk in and there's the Rosetta Stone. I mean, holy cow, you know. And so the, definitely the art. Um, we didn't do the eye. The I'm like, eh, it's yeah, a Ferris wheel in London, yeah. big deal, whatever. And we did do the Tate Museum, which is modern yes. art. I'd say a, the, a lot of the time in, in London was in art museums, which for us, we used travel points to get the hop on, hop off bus. Oh, I love those. Thing. And just hop on the bus, yeah. go look around, and it was... You know what I like about yeah. those is because you just you can go at your own pace. Well, and plus, if you're going from one tourist destination to another, the hop-on is it's simple because, you know, you leave the Tower of London and you want to go to the National Museum, the National Gallery. You just get on the hop-on and it lets you right off, and you're good to go. You don't have to navigate the metro. Uh, we went to Camden Market in London, that was fun. What is Camden Market? I have not been there. Oh, God, how would you, how would I describe that? Um, like the Pike Place Market, only bigger and more arty. Oh, okay. So um, open, I, can, you know, I can envision that. Like open air market um, with lots of vendors and um, artwork, and it, it was just really it was cool. The one regret we had in London is we did not go to a show. We didn't go to any any musicals there. Um, cause we would, if we go back to London, we will definitely yeah, do that. Let's do that next time. Yeah. So now you've heard the travel story of a mother and a daughter exploring Italy on their first international trip together and how that trip sparked a continued love of exploring other world destinations that led Erin to go back to Italy with her husband and also explore England and Iceland. If you are considering going on vacation in Italy or exploring any of the places that were mentioned in here, we talked about Rome, Venice, Florence, London, and Iceland. If you go to our website at amidlifetraveler.com and you look up episode 39, you will find a list. So I've created a curated list of suggestions for vacations in Italy that include these places and also some things to do, which would be day trips and attraction tickets and hop on hop off buses, etc. in some of these cities. That's a midlifetraveler.com episode 39. Thanks again for listening and safe travels wherever you may roam.